Amen, amen. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Hey, our country was founded on a declaration of independence. And we Americans, we love our independence. We say, I did it my way. I don't need anybody. And we take that, that mindset into our spiritual lives, and it leads us to a spot where we are some of the loneliest people on the planet. That we don't do community well, and that's why uh, in this uh, series we're focusing on together. And today, uh, never, never alone is our focus. Now, the Bible is amazingly wise in these things. Isn't that, super, isn't that a shock? The, God knows what we need and how we need it. And so, in a never alone kind of, kind of world that God created us for, the Bible says, since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. Now, we said this a while back. We, I, actually, last time, I made you turn and say, uh, I need you to the people around you. I'm not going to do that today. We had a lot of uh, propo marriage proposals last time. And it's, uh, appreciate your uh, enthusiasm. The Bible also says, this is the Apostle Paul, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or I'm absent or hear about you, I will hear about you that you are standing firm, one spirit, one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. And that's how God's designed the Christian life to be lived, in community. There's a whole lot of together that happens in God's word. Meanwhile, that's God's plan. And meanwhile, we're becoming more and more and more isolated as a people. That doesn't mean we're not connected somehow. We're just connected in a disconnected kind of way. People think they're connected because of social media, and yet they're isolated because they really don't know any people. We have, we have a lot of folks, and this is an American Christianity culture thing, a lot of folks that say, I want to follow Jesus. I just don't want to do that people stuff. And I'm telling you, the Christian life is designed by God to be lived in community, in relationship with other people. And when we say, I love Jesus, I love the Bible, I just don't like the people of God, that is antichrist. How about that word? It's against Christ. It's against the Word of God. And that's why people, I'm not satisfied with my church experience. You're not having a church experience because you're sliding in, sliding out in American Christianity. That's not what the church is. People say, well, I, I don't like other people. Well, they probably don't like you either because you're a difficult person. But we don't grow in patience and love and care and all these other things until we're in close proximity with other believers. So that's how God's designed the Christian life to be lived, that we might grow, that we might become, and we're just going to be a whole lot better at this together. Now, any of you do any yard work over the weekend? It's a lovely weekend, right? Went out and bought you some plants. Bless your hearts and bless your plants. Um. How many of your plants are already dead today? Like you planted them yesterday, already. It's already done. Yeah, a few of you, okay. I appreciate the effort, though, and I know that your local home improvement store does too. Yeah, those, those potted plants, every imaginable variety, and they look, they look pretty good there. Here's the thing about potted plants. They're not, they, they look like, oh, look at all of the green stuff together. But they're really not together at all. They're a bunch of individual little plants, all root-locked root and just hoping for a better life for themselves. But they're close together, kind of rubbing up against each other at your, at your favorite nursery, your favorite home improvement store, but they're not really, not really together. And I'm telling you, what we have is a lot of potted plant kind of Christ followers. Close proximity, but not really connected, not really doing this thing together. Those plants, they are alone, and so are a lot of people around here. Real communities have roots that there's an interlocking system. We're together. We stand together. There's a whole lot of those one another's. You know, we said we pray for one another, serve one another, help one another, care for one another, love one another, weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. 
we share and we bear burdens. We are known, and other people, uh, we know them. Jesus didn't die on the cross for a bunch of potted plant Christians is what I want to tell you. This whole Christian life is designed by God to be lived in a community. The whole thing of spiritual gifts is because I don't have them all, and neither do you. And we need each other to accomplish everything that God intends. A, a potted plant, it can produce some fruit, but it can't produce much by itself. But you put a lot of plants together in a field or on a farm, you know what? There's a lot of fruitfulness that comes out of that. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. That whole idea of remaining, abiding in Christ is a key to, to spiritual growth and spiritual health. But all those branches have to be connected all together too for that to happen and for there to be much fruit. And the reason maybe spiritually the fruit of the Spirit isn't growing in you and the fruit of the gospel isn't growing out of you is often because uh, you can only do so much by yourself. That's why the Bible's a together book, because together we can do eternal things. We've got to get past a potted plant, Christianity. Last year, there's a study that came out. It said that we are the most isolated uh, generation in generations and generations. Uh, loneliness is off the charts. It's one of the hottest topics out there in uh, sociology. And goodness gracious... What the article said was, it feeds itself. This is the dangerous part. The more isolated you are, the more lonely you are. The more, lo more lonely and isolated you are, the more selfish you become. A and you get caught in a tight, tight little spiral that leads to nowhere except more loneliness and more isolation. That's why God created the church, to break us out of what is a natural sinful tendency of sinful people. We're going to do this together. Now, Never Alone is our theme for today. Jimmy is going to flesh that out for you here in a bit. And last week we did something. We prayed for one, did some praying and some sharing with one another. In a Never Alone world, we're going to have a welcome time right now. And a study came out this week that said one out of five church attenders comes to church by themselves in America. One out of five. Well, you need to go, the five of you need to find each other right now, okay? We don't want anybody sitting by themselves, sitting alone. We don't want anybody that doesn't get noticed. And so we're going to have our welcome time right now. And in that, don't ask them to come sit with you. You go sit with them. But let's make sure nobody at this church is ever alone. I want to read a, a quote that uh, Chad, Chad had found and, and shared with me. It's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. A lot of you uh, know, might have heard of him, if, uh, pastor, scholar. It says, sin demands to have a man by himself. Uh, it withdraws him from the community. The, the more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him, and the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous in his isolation. Sin wants to remain unknown, and it shuns the light. In the darkness of the unexpressed, it poisons the whole being of a person. It's a powerful quote. Now, do any of you, have any of you ever watched the Discovery Channel or maybe uh, National Geographic? Wow, no, okay, good. I was gonna say, wow, no one's ever seen those shows. There, there, there's some great shows. You need to go and, and check those things out. And some of my favorite shows are when they just go out into the wild, right into the jungles or into the ocean or wherever. I'm always amazed at the photography, uh, the, the images that they're able to capture. And you see how these animals actually live in, in their habitats. Because, you know, most of the animals that I get to see are in the zoo. You know, and those guys are kind of kicked back with a diet coat going, what are you looking at? You know, and it's just, it's not, it's not the same as going out and finding these people or finding these animals out in the wild. So you, you see how they live, you see how they survive. Uh, and one of the, the, the interesting things to me is just kind of how they, how they hunt and they go after uh, uh, their prey. And, and what you see is, in, out in the wild, you see a lot of animals running in herds. Or, or running in packs. And the idea is that there is safety 
in, in numbers, but the animal that's, that's the hunter is always trying to get, what, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get one of, uh, of the animals that they're chasing. They're trying to get it separated from the herd because uh, he knows, or if the hunter happens to be the she, and a lot of the animals, if she can get them away from the herd, then what? They're vulnerable. They're, they're unprotected. And when they can do that, they know that they've got him. And that's the whole idea behind this, this Bonhoeffer quote is the enemy, the devil, what he wants to do is he wants us to get separated. He wants us to go it alone. He wants us to pull away from the, from the herd, pull away from the community, pull away from, from doing life together. Oh, and by the way, so when you hear that, you, you say, hey, life, life being alone, pulling away, you know, kind of being alone, that kind of sounds... That sounds good. Well, if the enemy's trying to encourage you to do that, then it's probably not a good idea. And just, just in case you've forgotten, here's the enemy's mission statement. It's found in John 10.10, 10, and it says that, that his whole existence is that he wants to kill, he wants to steal, and he wants to destroy. So what the enemy's going to do is he's going to root for your independence, He's going to say, yeah, you declare that independence in life. The enemy, he's going to cheer you on when, when, when he, uh, he sees you saying to the world, I'm going to do it, I'll do it my way. And the enemy, he's going to do whatever he can to facilitate you trying to fly solo through life. Because he knows if he can keep you away from the together, if you, if you avoid community, if you avoid group life, then you're going to be vulnerable to attack because no one, no one has your back. Chad read it earlier, Philippians 1.27. Lisa read it, and so now it's my turn. I want to read it. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. Paul said that our goal, our whole goal in life, we said the enemy is to, he, well, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, our goal, our mission statement should be to live our lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he says this, and here's how you're going to be successful at doing that. Standing firm in one spirit. Standing firm in one accord and, con and contending together for the faith contending together for the gospel. Paul didn't say this will happen best when you're on your own. He didn't say that, that this, this will happen best apart from, a, uh, from community or apart from accountability. Basically what Paul was saying, when he's talking to the church at Philippi, he's saying this is a strong church and the way that you're going to stay strong is if you stay together. Together. No Lone Rangers, no Han Solos, no me, myself, and I's. We've got to stick together. So if that's, if that's the goal, if that's what we're shooting for, then why do so many people insist on trying to do life on their own? I, I think there, there are at least two that I, I want to share with you today. There, there's more. Uh, but in, and I, I look at them kind of like as fears, maybe as these little, these little monsters that, that we kind of let in our lives. Uh, and if you know anything about, about fear, if you, if you let it fester and it'll grow and it'll become big and it, it, instead of being an irrational fear what it'll become to you is become a true fear and 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 you'll want to run away from it but the, these are these are fears that that drive people to be independent life uh livers is that, is that a, i don't know if that's an appropriate use of that term but hey we don't want to be independent life and here's the first one okay the first one is this it's the fear of being known it's the fear of being known because if I'm known, then I might, I'll be judged or, or, or I'll be criticized or, or worse yet, I, I might be ostracized. See, being known, letting people in, trusting others with, with your emotional stuff, with your life, that's risky and I get it. I know that it's risky and I know that some of you probably have done this before and gotten burned. And it seems easier, it seems safer, it seems more comfortable just to keep everyone, everyone at an arm's length. Because that, that's safer, that's easier, that's more comfortable. Uh, because if, if, if you know me, if you know the real me, then you might, you might judge me. You might judge me. Or, or if you know the real me, then, then you might see things in me that you'll want to criticize. Or, 
if you know the real me, then you might, you might push me out. And, and you may say, you know what, you're not, you're not welcome here anymore. And that's why so many of our conversations in life, so many conversations here in church are about the weather, are about politics, are about sports, or about the latest meme that we saw on social media. And don't get me wrong, it's okay to talk about those things, but in order to live life in community, to be genuine together, we have to be willing to open up our lives to one another and to let each other in. I thought, that's why I thought last week, Chad mentioned, I thought last week was so powerful. If you missed it, um, Chad, Chad gave us the opportunity to be in, in little small groups, just two or three, just kind of, we, we just kind of bunched up here in, in the worship center, and, and we just shared stuff about us. Uh, he gave us some prompts to, to talk about a joy, to talk about a burden, to talk about a, a significant memory, and then we were, able to, we were able to pray together. And a lot of you that weren't here are probably going, man, I'm glad I missed that one. But I, I'm telling you, it was, it was awesome. And, and, and I know it made some of you want to run and hide because that was super uncomfortable, but I'm so proud of you as a church for hanging in there and, and, and doing it. And we heard afterwards, we heard stories about meaningful conversations, even though we had a, a time limit with each one of those, about two or three minutes, because, you know, we, we had other stuff going on. But we heard stories about meaningful conversations because people were, were finally maybe for the first time or the first time in a long time we're opening up and it was powerful and amazing here's the thing amazing things start happening when we start sharing our lives with one another we find that we're not alone we're not alone we, we find that other people have similar experiences uh, we find that there are people who, who want to encourage us and we find that and here's here's the big one we find that other people are going through their own stuff too. It's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that I'm, I'm the only one that has a hard life. I'm the only one that's going, going through this. I'm the only one that's struggling. And you know why you think that? You think that because you're not living in community. You're not doing life together. There's no way that you would think that if you were sharing your life with other people that you're the only one you're not doing life with other people and chad said it earlier living life on your own can lead to selfishness because the only life that you see is yours and you know why times of togetherness and community can be so impactful why they can be so meaningful why they can be freeing because honestly it's how we were created to live and the truth of being known when done correctly Okay, now I know people can take advantage of it, but when done correctly means there is comfort, there's care, and there's collaboration. There's comfort in our lives to us, and we are able to comfort, there's care, people are able to care for us, and we're able to care for people, and there's collaboration. We're, we're able to work together to, to figure out life. Collaboration says that we, we struggle, we're all struggling, so let's figure it out together. It says, I've had those thoughts too. You're not, you're not crazy, you're not the only one. I, I've had those, so it's not just you. It says, I've been there, and, and I've made it through, so there's hope. There's hope, let me let me help. It says, I believe in you. It says, you're okay. It says, you've got this. It says, it feels bad now. I know it feels bad now, but it's going to get better, and I'm willing, I'm willing to journey with you and be there. 1 Peter 3, 8 says this, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. You see, when Peter says finally there, it's not, it's not that he's, this is the last thing that he's saying or it's the end of his conversation. Think more of like this is, this is the objective that we're trying to get to. This would, this would be the culmination of everything. This is what it would look like. He says we're to be like-minded. He's calling us to have the mind of, of Christ. And that what, having the mind of Christ will draw us together and not away from one another. It will draw us to care for one another. It will draw us to, to support one another, to love one another. It will draw us to, to be there for one another in, in, in little things in life, but also in, in, in the big stuff in life. Weeping with those who weep, rejoicing with those 
who rejoice. It's a connection that we have that's deeper than we have with anyone else because it's, it's a connection that we have in Christ because he, it's drawing us. And, and it happens through the heart of humility. Be compassionate towards one another and humble. And you need to know this. Humility wasn't, wasn't a sought-after virtue in, in Jesus' time. And when, in, in Old Testament time, in New Testament times, it wasn't a sought after virtue, but what happened was, is Christ elevated humility. Humility is, is it's the antidote to that selfishness, and selfishness leads to withdrawal. And withdrawal from community, and withdrawal from together. And that leads to a life that says this, stick with me, it's not okay to not be okay, and I want to make sure everyone thinks I'm okay, even though I'm not okay, but letting them know I'm not okay might not be okay, so it's better that I say I'm okay. Okay? <laughs> Let me say that again. This is, what, <laughs> this is what isolation will get you to. It's not okay to not be okay, and I want to make sure everyone thinks I'm okay, even though I'm not okay, but letting them know I'm not okay might not be okay, so it's better that they think that I'm okay. And just so we're clear, if that's how you're thinking, that's not okay. That's not okay. Selfishness, it, it leads to isolation, to the fear, the fear of being known. But being known leads to comfort from others, care from others, and collaboration. And let's be honest here. Being known means being accountable, and a lot of people don't want that. Because if you know me, then you know my stuff, and you're going to hold me accountable to my stuff, and I don't want that. I want to do, I want to do what I want to do, and that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be. That's exactly where he wants you to live. Being known says it's, it's okay to not be okay because I know not everyone is okay, and I want, them to let, I want to let them know that it's okay not to be okay too. Being known means I don't have to walk alone. The mind of Christ will draw us together. So there's that fear of the, fear of the known. And here's the second fear. The fear, that this is a big one too, there's the fear of being needed. Okay, so like if I'm needed, then, then this might get really messy or, or I, I'm not really equipped to do this. And bottom line is I just, I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need togetherness i don't need this i'm I, I i'm honestly i'm honestly good why why would i want to deal with other people's mess i've got my own mess going on plus i'm not good i'm not good at this whole people stuff i can't help them i'm not good at and then you just kind of fill in the blank when it comes to relationship and honestly i don't want that in my life and i don't need that in my life i don't need anyone so let me just say this out loud right now. I declare my independence, and that means that you people aren't my problem. I declare my independence, and you are not my problem. Now, I, I do want to clarify here. Being needed should not be translated as trying to control what's out of your control. So it's not that. And it's not, it shouldn't be translated as you have to take on all the world's problems. No, that's not it either. And it doesn't mean that I have to have my nose in everyone's business and then I have to fix everything. No, that's not it either. Being needed means I'm willing to walk through life with my community. I'm willing to, to journey together with the people that are, that are in my circle. Being needed means I'm not afraid to get messy. It means that I'm not afraid that I might not have all the answers, but that's okay because I can ask other people. And it means I'm not afraid to ask for help and I'm not afraid to ask to help. It, it, it means that I'm not afraid to lock arms with, with, with people and, and do some of, the, some of the heavy lifting. Lean on me when you're not strong, and I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for, what's the next part? Because I forgot it. It won't be long till I'm gonna need someone to lean on, right? Yeah, 
It's that whole idea of just locking arms and just saying, hey, lean on me, I'll lean on you, and we're going to walk through this together. And here's the truth of being needed. The truth of being needed is, is that we're all a piece of the puzzle that's not complete if we're not all connected. We're all a piece of the puzzle that's not complete if we're not all connected. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though there are many of us, we are one body in Christ, and individually, listen to this, and individually what? Say it with me. We belong to each other. Look at, the, Chad didn't want to do it this week, I'll do it. Look at each other and say, we belong to each other. Okay? And break out into the Grease song. We go together like rama lama lama blah, 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 blah. Okay, don't do that. I'm just kidding. We belong to each other. We, we, you, you are needed. If, if there's a puzzle piece missing, then the puzzle is not complete. Now, I'm not a puzzle guy. Okay, I, I don't get a lot of joy out of dumping a box of a million pieces and trying to figure out how they go so I can see the picture that's already on the box. I know what it is. There it is. Look, here. You don't have to do the puzzle. I get there's a, but here's the thing. I can't imagine something more frustrating for a puzzle person than to get all the way to the end and then boom, there's one piece missing. I have 999,999 pieces and I'm missing piece one million. Here's the deal. It's not complete, is it? You can see the picture. You get the idea. You know what it's supposed to be, but you don't have that last piece. And if you don't have that last piece, then the puzzle's not, not complete. And we have to realize that we are a piece of God's puzzle. And let me tell you this, you are an important piece of that puzzle that in God's plan that God's putting together. We belong to each other because that's how God created us. You know how, how a puzzle, the pieces, it's, it, by itself, it just doesn't make sense. But when you put it together, it's meant to be connected because it's in connection that it makes something. And we were called to be connected we belong to each other. He created us to work as one body. Now, we're different parts of the puzzle, but we're still a part of that puzzle. We're all, we're all different. We don't have the same talents. We don't have the same gifts. We don't have the same skill sets. We don't have the same ideas. We don't have the same personalities. We're all unique. We're all unique. We're all different, but... All of those uniquenesses, all those differences, God designed it that way because on their own, not very effective. But when brought together, Scripture says that the gates of hell, they're not safe because the church, the church, when it's done right, is unstoppable. Now, some of you might, might be arguing with me uh, right now. Maybe not out loud. Maybe you are out loud. I know. I, says, I just can't hear you. But you've been mentally arguing with me, and, and here's, one of the, here's one of the arguments that I think might be happening, and, and it's this. I don't need this. I don't need it. You see, because I, I, I've, got, I've got my golfing buddies, and uh, we, we meet every week, and we're together. Man, we, we, we're, 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 a, we're a tight-knit group. Or, or I've, got this, I've got this group that I, that I work out with, and, and we work out together all the time. Or there's this, we got these parents, these parents on my kids' teams, and we're, we're together, we're close, we're tight. I've got a, 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 a book club, or I've got my lunch buddies, or breakfast buddies, or I've got my, my motorcycle, whatever. You know, you've, I've, got, I've got my together already, and I don't really need it here, too. I don't need it here too but here's what i would say to that when god talks about the one another's in scripture he's talking about that in the context of his bride the church you see people people who gather together for community for discipleship for learning for encouragement for prayer and for support that that's what the church is and then we go out from here and we 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 
We are the church or we be the church in community. Go, go be the church with your golf buddies. Go be the church with your, with your workout friends. Go, go be the church with the other parents on your team. Be the church with your book club or with, with your lunch buddies. And, and so many people are missing that step. They're missing the step of the church. And we talk about consumerism um, within the church in, in one of the biggest ways that we see nowadays of Christian consumerism is getting God on, on our own terms. So um, we say, well, we'll I'll, I'll listen to worship music while I'm, while I'm jogging or while I'm mowing the yard. Um, I'll, read, I'll read scripture in between, in between games while I'm waiting for my, my kids' next game. I'll, I'll read scripture. Uh, I'll pray uh, while, I'm, while I'm driving. Or I'll, I'll keep up with my community on social media. Uh, and we'll, we'll interact there. And by the way, there's nothing, let me say this, there's nothing wrong with listening to worship music while you run or while you mow. There's nothing wrong with reading your Bible in between sporting events. There's nothing wrong with praying while you're driving unless you close your eyes. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with keeping up. There's nothing wrong with keeping up with your, with your community on social media. But the reality is that those should be, listen to this, those should be supplements and not replacements for biblical community that is found in being a part of the church, which is the body of Christ. They're meant to be supplements and not replacements. You may think, I don't need community, but I'll tell you this. Community, and let me get more specific, this community, FBC Allen, we need you. We need all of you. We're better together, and we can't be together if we're all out there declaring our independence. Instead, what we need to be doing is demonstrating with our lives our interdependence on one another and our deep dependence on God. You see, God created you to be known. He created you to be known, and he created you to be needed known by a community of believers and needed as a part of a group of believers who come together to love on one another and then to go out and share that love of God with others. We need you. And let me say this, you need us. And we all desperately need God. Let's be what he created us to be, never alone, but always together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity to come together in this place. God, to, to sing together.